Kidding. Chapter 7. The first word is dauntless, which simply means kind of super brave or kind of crazy brave. You're not even really thinking about any of the consequences. So that's dauntless. The second word is morbid, which means characterized by this kind of gloomy unwholesomeness. Uh, if you speak of the morbidity of something, um, it also means pertaining to disease, but usually if someone is having morbid thoughts, they're just kind of teenage angsty. The third word is ponderous, which has nothing to do with thinking, or in this case, pondering, but it has everything to do with being too big, too weighty, too unwieldy to do much with. Um, to a certain extent, it can also mean so ex excruciatingly dull um, and too heavy to deal with. Dauntless 8th grade girls fascinate my morbid curiosity, semicolon. They are ponderous people, ungainly to deal with, humanely. I have no idea if that really makes sense, but it's taken me a long time to come up with a sentence, or at least a compound sentence. Chapter 7, The Governor's Hall. Not too much happens except setting the stage for an excellent chapter 8. But in this case, Hester makes her way to the governor's hall, ostensibly to give the governor his newly sewn Hester hip pair of gloves. And, but I should say the real reason is that she's heard that the town magistrates are considering taking Pearl away from her, and Hester cannot have that. As you're reading, pay particular attention to the sunshine and how it behaves in, the, in front of the governor's hall. Also, um... Take a look at how Hester is perceived in the kind of funhouse mirror um, breastplate of the armor found in the governor's hall, hall. and also what Pearl um, can't wait to get her hands on at the end of the chapter. I can't believe I forgot to mention in the synopsis one of my favorite little vignettes of the Scarlet Letter, but um, you'll hear about it in this quote. It's not all too terribly important, but... Uh, I thought I'd share it. As the two wayfarers came within the precincts of the town as they're headed to the governor's hall, the children of the Puritans looked up from their play, or what passed for play with those somber little urchins, and spoke gravely, and spake gravely, one to another. Behold, verily, there is the woman of the scarlet letter, and a truth, moreover, there is the likeness of the scarlet letter running along by her side. Come therefore, and let us fling mud at them. But Pearl, who was a dauntless child, after frowning, stamping her foot, and shaking her little hand with a variety of threatening gestures, suddenly made a rush at the knot of her enemies, and put them all to flight. She resembled in her fierce pursuit of them an infant pestilence, the scarlet fever of some half-fledged angel of judgment, whose mission was to punish the sins of the rising generation. She screamed and shouted too, with a terrific volume of sound which doubtless caused the hearts of the fugitives to quake within them. The victory accomplished, Pearl returned quietly to her mother and looked up smiling into her face. Okay, One of the critiques of this novel is that Pearl is rather unbelievable, but to a certain extent that's unfair, um, or at least unfair in terms of the time Hawthorne was writing. Uh, realism, or the idea of realism, uh, didn't really establish itself in American literature until after the Civil War. So we're still in the heart of some pretty romantic ideals. And this story is a romance in more ways than four, and it's not really meant to be believed as anything resembling a verisimilitude. Um, no children say, that does verity fling mud. That's ridiculous. But I'm pretty certain that there has been no time in history that there have been a passel of evil urchins um, who have said something like, let us verily fling mud at the whore and her child. Um, that doesn't really happen, but that's not all that important. Certainly, Pearl felt that she was an outsider, um, mud or not, and to a certain extent, this is just indicative of that. As Hester and Pearl approach the governor's hall, Hawthorne spends a good paragraph detailing um, the facade of the building, in paragraph 8. It had indeed a very cheery aspect, the walls being overspread with a kind of stucco, in which fragments of broken glass were plentifully intermixed, so that when the sunshine fell aslantwise over the front of the edifice, 
It glittered and sparkled as if diamonds had been flung against it by the double handful. Pearl, looking at this bright wonder of a house, began to caper and dance and imperatively re required that the whole breath of sunshine should be stripped off its front and given her to play with. No, my little Pearl, said her mother, thou must gather thine own sunshine. I have none to give thee. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to where the sunshine falls and who is allowed to play with it and who it avoids. It is a big, um, and whom it avoids. The sunshine motif certainly reflects um, Hawthorne's uh, love affair um, with certain romantic ideals. And it's strangely enough, this dark romantic is quite interested in what the sunshine is doing. As Hester and Pearl make their way by the bond servant, or the doorman in this case, as they're walking down the hall towards the garden of the governor's hall, Pearl is m mystified by something shiny, as we all are. And it is a um, breastplate of a suit of armor. And Pearl um, is excited about the distortion and the kind of like funhouse mirror aspect of it. And she says in paragraph 18, Mother, cried she, I see you here. Look, look. Hester looked, by way of humoring the child, and she saw that, owing to the peculiar effect of this convex mirror, the scarlet letter was represented in exaggerated and gigantic proportions, so as to be greatly the most prominent feature of her appearance. In truth, she seemed absolutely hidden behind it. Pearl pointed upward also at the similar picture in the headpiece, smiling at her mother with the elfish intelligence that was so familiar an expression on her small physiognomy. That look of naughty merriment was likewise reflected in the mirror, with so much breadth and intensity of effect that it made Hester Prynne feel as it could not be the image of her own child, but, an imp, but of an imp who was seeking to mold itself into Pearl's shape. Okay, there's lots going on there, but the most important aspect is that, at least in this part of the story still, Hester is obscured by the letter. She is almost hidden behind it, and we have yet to see the best of Hester, but that time is coming.